Once described by the Wall Street Journal as a restless genius, Ray Kurzweil is an American inventor, author and futurist. He's been part of a number of major technological breakthroughs, including the first flatbed scanner, the first print-to-speech reading machine for the blind, and the world's first commercially marketed speech recognition system. He's also written several books, including The Age of Spiritual Machines. Ray Kurzweil is the subject of the feature-length documentary Transcendent Man, and he joined us earlier from Boston. Ray Kurzweil, thanks for talking to us. My pleasure. Now, we've just seen in that story from Mark Willisey the potential use of humanoids working as nurses, giving lectures. What do you imagine humanoids will be used for in the future? Well, I think we'll have robots in all sizes and shapes. Some will look like humans because we'll give them human jobs, particularly if we want them to relate to us as companions or even lovers. Uh, but some will have no shape at all. I mean, we use Google every day. That's artificial intelligence. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence, is going to get smarter and smarter. By my calculations, it will reach human levels of intelligence by 2029, and then combine it with ways in which they're already smarter. They can access vast amounts of information. We're hard-pressed to remember a handful of phone numbers. Japan has an ageing population, and, and they're hoping that robots will be able to help with uh, aged care. One university in Japan has released an emotional humanoid robot to, to relieve stress in patients. Do humanoids really have that capacity to connect with humans on an emotional level? Well, that's really the big frontier right now is for computers in general to master human emotions. Emotions is not some sideshow to human intelligence. It's actually the most complicated, intelligent thing we do. Being funny, getting the joke, expressing a loving sentiment, though, that's the cutting edge of human intelligence. Uh, if we were to say intelligence is only logical intelligence, computers are already smarter than us. Uh, I believe it's going to be about the, over the next 20 years where we close that gap in terms of human superiority today in emotional intelligence. So today, uh, computers can understand human emotions in certain situations. Watson, the IBM computer that won Jeopardy, did have to understand some things about human emotion to master the language in that game. Uh, but they're not yet at human levels. But they're, they're getting there. You predict that humans will soon merge with machines. What do you mean by that, and how long will it, and how will it manifest itself? Well, look at the early indicators. Uh, if you have Parkinson's, you can put a computer inside your body, connects into your brain, uh, and it replaces the functionality, of, or at least some of the functionality of the neurons that are destroyed by the disease. The latest generation allows you to download new software to the computer inside your body, connected to your brain from outside the patient. There are a dozen different neural implants that are being experimented with or used, like cochlear implants for the deaf. Uh, today, these require surgery, so we use them for serious medical conditions. But ultimately, computers will get very small. I mean, this computer is actually a thousand times more powerful than the computer I used when I was a student. Uh, it's a million times cheaper, and it's a million times smaller. Uh, Twenty-five years from now, this will be about the size of a blood cell. We will have, in fact, millions of intelligent nanobots, little robots the size of blood cells, I think that's actually more exciting than humanoid robots. Going inside our body, keeping us healthy from inside, augmenting our immune system, going inside our brain through the capillaries without surgery, putting our brains on the Internet, giving us access to vast amounts of knowledge and so on. And you, you say that you think we'll be a billion times smarter by the year 2045. How, how is that possible? The... The important thing to understand and the core of my thesis is that information technology, like computers, but it also uh, refers to our biology, which is an information process, doubles in power in less than a year. It's exponential growth. And that's not our intuition. Our intuition about the future is that it's linear. So if I take 30 steps over, let's say, 25 years, I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and get to 30. That's our intuition, but that's not correct. It actually goes 2, 4, 8, 16, and at step 30, you're at a billion. And that's not an idle speculation about the future only. Uh, this is a billion times more powerful per dollar than it was when I was a student, and we will do it again in 25 years. We will match human intelligence 
and go beyond it by 2029. By 2045, this artificial intelligence we're creating, which is really part of our civilization, it's not some invasion from Mars, we're already deeply integrated with it. This is not inside my body, but it may as well be, because it really is part of who I am. Uh, this will go inside us. Uh, it will make us a billion times smarter by 2045, according to my calculations. How will it go inside us? How will it go from artificial intelligence into our own intelligence? Well, it's important to understand that artificial intelligence today, which does exist, uh, I mean, every time you place a cell phone call or send an email, intelligent algorithms with the information, uh, every time you use Google, you're using artificial intelligence. Uh, it is part of who we are. And even if it's not inside our bodies, it's very close to us, and it's really part of the human machine civilization. And as I mentioned, people have computers already inside their bodies and brains. Every single organ, like computerized pancreases, are being designed with computer intelligence to be placed inside the human body. Uh, another important exponential trend is the shrinking of technology. I've measured this at a rate of about 100 in 3D volume per decade. So within a couple of decades, these really will be the size of blood cells, and we'll be able to put them inside the body to, to be healthier and, and smarter. They can go inside the brain, put, our, put us on uh, in a virtual reality environment, uh, and so we'll experience virtual environments and have virtual bodies in those environments. Just augmenting the immune system is very powerful. Consider the limitations of your immune system today. It doesn't recognize cancer. It thinks that's you. Uh, it might turn on you. It has lots of, it has lots of uh, failure modes. Uh, we can fix those with uh, more intelligent, uh, more uh, rapid uh, form of protection in the form of uh, nanobots that augment the immune system. That's just one of the many applications uh, that we will find. Uh, but this is not a new story. We are putting computers in our bodies and brains already. Not, not everyone shares uh, your optimism. On, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but not everyone shares your optimism on this. Uh, yeah. For example, Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft, said in, in a recent interview he thought you were over-enthusiastic about the progress that was, the be, that was being made. He said he had people working on some of the problems and that, that they were multiple, multiple decades away from even putting a biology textbook inside computer software. Well, that's what people said about uh, computers being able to play Jeopardy, which actually requires a very sophisticated understanding of human language. Uh, I predicted, a lot of my predictions people thought were way off and would take centuries. I predicted the emergence of the World Wide Web in the early 80s, and people thought that was nuts, connecting hundreds of millions of people, when the entire defense budget could only connect 2,000 people. Uh, in the early 80s, I predicted the computer would take the World Chess Championship in 98. It happened in 97. People then said, okay, well, chess is an easy game, but they'll never master human language, like games like Jeopardy. Uh, that has now happened, and people then dismiss that. The reason that people like Paul Allen make these predictions is they're thinking linearly about the future. And as I said before, that's our intuition. That's actually hardwired in our brains to think that things are going to progress in a linear manner. Uh, so in 30 steps, we'll get to 30, whereas uh, information technology like computers and artificial intelligence are progressing exponentially. It goes 2, 4, 8, 16, and at step 30, we're at a billion. Uh, that's why the reality turns out to be radically different from our intuition. There are others who don't share your optimism, but this will be a good thing either. Bill Joy, for example, co-founder co of Sun Microsystems, says he's worried that intelligent robots in the future will be superior, will self-replicate, and will end up wiping us out. You don't share his concerns? Well, actually, Bill and I agree on the dangers. Uh, Bill is not against technology. In fact, he works as a venture capitalist to develop new technologies uh, for purposes that will help humanity. Uh, and we both agree on the tremendous potential to overcome human problems with these exponentially growing technologies. We actually agree on the fact that these technologies are progressing exponentially. Uh, and, and we both agree that there'll be dangers. In fact, his famous article, the cover story in Wired magazine, Why the Future Doesn't Need It, was based on my book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, which he says at the beginning, because I've talked about the downsides. Technology is a double-edged sword. It has been ever since fire, which kept us warm, but also was used as an 
agent of destruction. Uh, these technologies can be used for, uh, for violent purposes and destructive purposes as well. And I've written extensively about that. I would say we've been helped more than we've been hurt, but that's a debate that people can have. We certainly had a lot of harm. 180 million people were killed in the wars of the 20th century, certainly exacerbated by the advanced technology that was available. On the other hand, we're living much more productive, longer lives. Human life expectancy was 37 in 1800. Life was very harsh, difficult, poverty uh, filled, if you read Thomas Hobbes about what life was like a few hundred years ago. Uh, so I think the answer is actually to work on protecting ourselves from the da downsides, having ethical standards to prevent abuse. It's a complicated subject, but uh, the idea of relinquishing these technologies, the idea that let's just not do them, let's not do AI because it's too dangerous, I think is completely unrealistic and actually would make the world more dangerous. You've said that you find death unacceptable and you think you can make yourself immortal. How do you plan to do that? Well, you know, you can never, I can never come on your program and say, you know, I've done it. I've, I'm now immortal. I've now lived forever because uh, it's never forever. But what we can do is overcome uh, increasingly with each year more and more of the things that, that make our lives short. And that's not a new story. Life expectancy was 23,000 years ago, so we're making progress. This is going to go into high gear. Now that health and medicine is an information technology, which is a brand new thing, and it's going to progress exponentially, we will be able to reprogram biology away from aging, away from disease. Uh, in the books I've written on this subject, uh, some with a co-author, Terry Grossman, MD, uh, we talk about three bridges to radical life extension. Bridge one is what you can do right now. I'm very active in slowing down aging processes using today's technology. Uh, the second bridge is the full flowering of the biotechnology revolution where we can reprogram biology. And the third bridge are these nanobots I talked about, uh, nanotechnology where we can go beyond biology uh, and, for example, have an immune system that can combat any pathogen, including cancer and many other things like that. We will get to a point... And in my uh, view, it's only about 15 years away, where every year that goes by, we're adding more than a year to your remaining life expectancy. So that's a tipping point, Okay. something Aubrey de Grey calls longevity escape velocity. Ray Kurzweil, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks very much for joining us on Lightline tonight. My pleasure.